Next up uh, is someone who you've already seen once this morning, uh, uh, David DeSena, who I've known for, for several years, his work on uh, emotion and cognition and the social spread of emotional states and priming compassion uh, was uh, so powerful for us at PopTech that we've invited him several times to come up and share that with a much larger community of practitioners and, and innovators and who today is gonna talk to us a little bit about trust and one of the things you have to do is give him a huge round of applause because today his book is available on amazon.com this is this is launch day for uh, david destino's uh, fantastic new book on trust and he's going to talk about that in robotics right now so please welcome david destino okay um what I want to talk to you about today is a is a question that strikes at the heart of social life and simply put that is can I trust you? Right? And in particular, what I want to talk about is whether we can answer that question with any level of accuracy about people we don't know. And if so, how do we do it? I think we can all agree that human flourishing uh, often requires trust and cooperation. We can certainly accomplish more working together than we can on our own, but trust also entails risk. If one partner doesn't uphold his or her end of the bargain, they can profit at your expense. Now, as we know, cooperation and trust are quite common, but so is cheating and selfishness. It's a delicate yet dynamic balance. And the big question is, how do we go about optimizing it? And for our purposes today, what role can technology play in helping us do that? Now, when we try and figure out if someone's trustworthy, we often rely on their reputation. You know, has this person been reliable in the past? But there's a few problems with that. One is, we know from decades of scientific research that Reputation isn't really a good predictor. People's moral behavior is a lot more variable than any of us would expect. The second problem, of course, is sometimes we don't have access to people's reputation. We don't know what they've done before, but we still have to decide if they're worthy of trust. And how do we do that? Well, it makes, I mean, and if we're wrong, right, if we're wrong, this is what's gonna happen to you <laughs> continually. And that's not a good outcome, as, as all of you will believe. And so it, it makes sense, right, that the ability to be able to decide if we can trust someone would be a huge advantage that the mind could have. Now, trust happens all the time. We think about, um, should I give you back the money I owe you, or will, if Arturo takes money from me, will he give it back to me? Um, we rely on people for important things. Can I trust you to give me blood? Can I trust you to give me a kidney if I need it? Um, when I was in college, my friends would always ask, Will you help me move? I'll help you. Um, as we all know, it doesn't always, it doesn't always work that way. Every time we, we agree to trust somebody, we're making ourselves vulnerable by providing resources. And if those don't get paid back, we'll be the upside down guy getting our money shaken out of, metaphorically. And so it makes sense that the mind would have evolved some capacity to know if you can trust somebody, even if it's not perfect, right? Even if it's just above chance, it would provide a huge advantage. Now, we've been looking forever for what those signals are, right? What can we use? Uh, and as Lisa said, the, the, the TSA has spent over $40 million in a program um, looking for certain cues that led them nowhere, unfortunately, as, as the GAO found is, is pretty much worthless. And the problem is people look for cues because, you know, is it, is it the smile, right? If you're smiling, can I trust you or can I not? Is it shifty eyes? Does that mean it? It's none of those things. It couldn't be. If it were that easy, we would have found it a long time ago. Um, the problem with trust cues is you don't want them to be right out there, right? If there were a cue like a smile that meant I could be trusted or not, it's like walking around with a big T on your forehead that says, I'm trustworthy, exploit me. Or it's like walking around with a big C on your forehead that says, I'm a cheater, no one will ever want to interact with you. And so trust is something that has to be played close to the vest and has to kind of come out as you're interacting with each other and you're trying to feel each other out. And so it has to be subtle and dynamic. It's also gonna to need to be context dependent. But most importantly, what we've, thought about is that you need to look for multiple cues at the same time. I mean, think about it. If I'm touching my face, does that mean I'm nervous or does it mean I have an itch? You don't know. You can't tell from one cue. It can mean lots of things. And so really what you need to be able to do is to look at multiple cues to disambiguate what any single one means in kind of a constraint satisfaction way. And as I'm going to show you, that's the way your mind does it, even though you don't know it. And so we designed two quick experiments that I'm gonna, well, they weren't quick, but I'm gonna tell you about them quickly. Uh, to look at this, um, 
the first was kind of exploratory. We wanted to, to throw, uh, start from the bottom up. And, and I should say, I had wonderful collaborators in this, uh, Bob Frank and Dave Pizarro from Cornell, Cynthia Brazil, is Cynthia here? No, but Jinju, Jinju is here, and she can tell you all about the robot and her great algorithms for, for doing machine learning detection of trust later. Um, in phase one, we were simply going to try to identify some cues and then demonstrate that they had some accuracy. And in phase two, and this is where the technology really comes in, an innovative technology, is to actually manipulate those cues in an exceedingly precise way and see if we can actually change people's behavior, trust-relevant behavior. So kind of an exploratory followed by a confirmatory process. So let me tell you how we uh, did the exploratory one. We'll start with that first. Um, the question is simple. What candidates do people use? And so we brought in um, people from the Boston community, uh, 86 participants, assigned them to um, 43 dyads. So you were stuck with somebody who you never met before. And you basically had to uh, talk with this person for five minutes and then kind of get to know you paradigm, after which you were going to play uh, a game for real money. So real stakes were involved. Uh, and we gave you a list of topics to talk about, but you could talk about anything you want. The only thing you couldn't do was talk about the game you were going to play or make promises to people of what you were going to do. And so people came into the lab, and uh, we, for some of them, we videotaped them from three times sync camera angles so that we could watch exactly and record every motion that they were making. Um, some people conversed face-to-face. -face, other people conversed uh, over the net. And so the reason for this is in one, the same amount of semantic information is exchanged, but in one you have access to their nonverbals, in one you don't. And after that, we put them in separate rooms and they played this game that pitted self-interest versus communal interest. And the way it works is everybody got uh, tokens. Each token was worth a dollar to you, so each person got four tokens. But if you exchanged them with your partner, they were worth eight dollars to him or her. And so there's a couple decisions you can do here. One is you can hope that the partner uh, will give you all of his because you seem like a nice guy and you don't give him anything. And then you're going to end up with 12 and he's going to end up with nothing, right? That's dishonest behavior. The most rational communal behavior is we each exchange everything we have. We started with four and now we have eight. But that's only a rational behavior if you think your partner is actually going to be trustworthy. Um, and so we let our partners play this game and we simply asked them to predict what, their, what the other person was going to do and to make a choice of how they wanted to spend their money. So what happened? Well, the interesting thing was how trustworthy you behaved here. Higher numbers mean the more tokens you gave, which means the more trustworthy you are. Higher numbers, I mean, the actual amount of trustworthy behavior was equal across conditions, which is great. So it wasn't that when you talked online, you were any less trustworthy. But the errors you made in predicting what your partner would do were less. When you saw your partner's body behavior, this is absolute value of the error in your prediction of what they were going to do versus what you actually did. Um, you, were, you were significantly more accurate in predicting whether your partner was going to cheat you or be trustworthy when you had access to their body language. So you knew something's there. We're picking up something. The problem is what it is. To make a long story short, we built lots of different models assembling different sets of cues, and we came up with four cues that when they happen together, not, not all at the same time, of course, but when they happen within the same context, the same conversation, signify that uh, you're going to be untrustworthy. Hand touching, face touching, crossing arms, and leaning away. Crossing arms and leaning away are, are measures of, I don't want to affiliate with you. Fidgeting, touching your face are measures of anxiety. Put those together, it kind of means, uh, I don't like you and I'm anxious because I'm going to screw you over in a minute. Okay. So if you look at these, what you see is that the more a partner showed these cues, the fewer tokens you expected that person to give you. And the more you yourself show these cues, and sometimes you're the partner, of course, because these are dyads, the less cues you, in fact, gave. And so what we have are clear predictions. When the more these cues occur, the less trustworthy the person is. And people could pick up on it. But they had no conscious awareness of what they were using. If you ask them, like, oh, I don't know, I just feel like he's not going to trust me. And so the sense is our minds are extracting this information in a pattern detection sense automatically without our even knowing it, which proves there is a signal that we can read trust intentions. But phase two is, right, how do I know these are the cues that matter? How do I know when you cross your arms that it's really not your left pupil is dilating, right? And that's the thing that really matters. To know we have to use technology, we have to control everything. And that means we have to use a robot. This is Nexi. She was designed by Cynthia Brazil at MIT's Media Lab. And I am forever grateful for the collaboration we've, we've had with them. And I encourage you to go talk to Jinju after um, uh, if you want to learn more about the way Nexi actually works. So all we did was simply replace the person you were talking with with the robot. 
I'll show you what it looks like in a second. And next, he was programmed to either make these sets of cues or not that we thought uh, mattered. She was controlled by people behind the scenes, uh, one who was her voice and one who actually uh, controlled whether or not she made the motion so that the voice person could be kept blind. This is Jolie you see here on the left. There's a webcam on her face that's, that's detecting as she moves her head. The robot's head moves in real time as she speaks. It's picking up her phonemes and moving its mouth. Leah controls whether or not she gives the trust gestures or not, so Jolie's blind to it. And Jinju is our robot mischief watcher, because every once in a while the robot would do something really weird and freak people out. Um, <laughs> but not too, not too often. <laughs> so. Um, uh, we had uh, 65 participants. Uh, we assigned them to um, speak with Nexi. Half of them got the tr untrustworthy cues. Half of them got the trustworthy ones. Uh, and they then played the monetary game. Here's Nexi crossing her arms. Here she is touching her face. Um, but here's what it looks like in real time. This is really interesting. So my name's Nexi. What's your name? My name's Kim. Kim? It's yeah. very nice to meet you. You too. To get us started today, why don't I tell you a little bit about myself? Okay. I was born and built at the MIT Media Lab two years ago. So, I guess in human years, I'm pretty young. But in robot years, that's more like... And people quickly years. advanced to uh, and actually, being comfortable. So, you can see in self-disclosing. That's basically all I do for fun, though. I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> Did you grow up? In upstate New York? Yeah, I did um, until I was 18 when, when I moved out here. It seems like that must have been a big transition for you. Um, it was. It was a really big transition, but um, I kind of decided that um, it wasn't the life that I wanted, and so I went. And we heard stories about pets dying, and there was one guy who asked Nexi if she believed in God, but for the most part it was... It was pretty good. This is what it looks like head on. share a big open room. There are lots of cords and gadgets. So it's probably not like your house, but it's home for me. Why don't you tell me about where you're from? Well, I was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and uh, I have a residency in Somerville right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, then they played this game with Nexi, right? They had to make a judgment of how, we told her that she had an, she had an artificial intelligence algorithm that was gonna determine how much money she wanted to share with you based on how the, 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 the program ran, which is why we couldn't run it at, at MIT because no one would believe us. Um, but here we had, we had community members that we brought in from the Boston community um, here. And then a few questionnaires. And um, what we found, uh, to make a long story short, is that when Nexi made those four cues that we thought mattered, um, people judged her as untrustworthy. It's not that they liked her less, and this is important, right? Because we all have friends we like who we wouldn't trust with our money. And so that's what makes it real to me. It's not just that, oh, I was freaked out by this robot when she does this. No, they liked her just the same in both conditions, but they didn't trust her. And the less they trusted her, the fewer tokens they gave her, and the fewer tokens they expected her to give them, thus in, in, engaging in, in, in reciprocal, selfish, untrustworthy behavior. So to close, cues to, cues to trustworthiness can be imperfectly assessed. But the interesting thing in some ways is that, and I think the more profound thing in some ways, is that the mind will use these cues to ascribe moral intentions to technological entities. And that opens up a whole Pandora's box in some ways. What it means is technology is good enough, close enough that that may not make you feel whether or not you can trust it or if you want to interact with it, but this certainly will, right? It doesn't have to be exactly human, but it has to have enough of the human emotional elements into it that it can ping our trust machinery. And what that means is a whole discussion I think is worth having. For people like Cynthia who want to design these robots to build trust with people, it's great because they can accompany kids into... Um, places where parents can't go, like radiation treatment for kids who are suffering cancer, they can go in with the kids and they can express these cues that actually make the kids feel comfortable. If I'm a marketer, what does it mean? It means, we know trust sells. I've got the perfect trust person for you. We can change it. We're working on cues now. Jinji has found some cues that actually signal trustworthiness. Nothing leaks out. Well, the person stuff leaks out. With this, nothing leaks out. And so when you're talking to the virtual avatar online, next time you go for customer helpers trying to sell you something, remember that. Thanks.